Welcome to the October, no, yeah, it's October, I'm sorry, October 2020 uh, Plantsman Store of the J.C. Ralston Arboretum. It's a perfect warm October day, and uh, we'll look at some highlights of the season. Um, I'm standing in front of the T. viburnum, it's viburnum cetigerum, and it might very well be the um, most beautiful of all the viburnums when it comes to the fruit display. Um, it's been colored up for a while and it'll continue well into the uh, winter after many hard freezes. The fruit will uh, shrivel a little bit, but it'll remain colorful for most of the winter as well. Um, it is deciduous. In typical of viburnums, the leaves are in pairs. The leaves are opposite. Um, and this is not a new introduction. This is a plant that has been around for a long, long time, but has always seemed to be able to sort of uh, avoid the radar screen. So um, it's one I want to talk up and encourage people to grow. Um, it's been in the Arboretum for decades, um, and there's not a single seedling to be seen around it. So. It's not one that I worry about becoming an invasive exotic. Um, now, why would this viburnum be called the T viburnum? Because historically, the leaves have been used to make a tea. I don't know anything about the quality of that tea, whether it's a kind of tea that you only resorted to when you ran out of Camellia sinensis, or whether it's something particularly wonderful. We'll just have to try one day. Viburnum cetigerum. We we're gonna need uh, about half a minute to walk to our nest next plant. So just keep up with the crowd. Um, one of the most lovely um, aspects of October is the scent of um, the osmanthus, um, especially the tea olive osmanthus fragrance. This is not osmanthus fragrance, but it's um, um, osmanthus ex fortunii. Yeah, thanks, Jim. Which is a hybrid between fragrance and um, Osmanthus elicifolia or heterophilus. Um, fragrance is, is, can get clobbered in a, an especially cold winter, but the other parent of Fortunii gives it a lot of um, cold hardiness. Um, this is quite a showy uh, display of flowers. Um, Osmanthus only needs to open a few flowers to perfume the whole garden. They are large evergreen shrubs. Um, and though I always hate to say such a thing, they uh, I've not known deer to eat osmanthus. Um, but yeah, I can see half a dozen hand, hands up in the audience right now of people who want to say, well, they eat it in my garden. But um, it's not been my experience. You want to peek at this osmanthus? Sure. Yeah. Now, this is a cultivar of osmanthus fragrance. This is um, apricot gold. The typical color of osmanthus fragrance, or at least the plant that's been in the gardens in the south for, I'm sure, over 100 years, is white to cream colored like the first osmanthus we saw, but in osmanthus fragrance, they can also be orange or yellow. This one was better a week ago. The flowers are now turning brown um, and shedding, but most of them will have successive flushes of bloom. 
the best of them will bloom intermittently on and off through the year. Senna's not too long ago were classified as Cassias, so you might know it by that name. Um, many of the uh, Senna's are herbaceous perennials dying to the ground in the winter, but this is a, a shrub. Um, nice clean foliage. Uh, the sulfur butterflies, those wonderful yellow butterflies that are very evident this time of year, um, their caterpillars feed on senna's. I don't know whether they don't care for this species or because this species is in shade most of the day, they leave this one alone, but they certainly um, defoliated our senna marilandica, the Maryland um, um, senna. It can be grown from seed. And it does come up in the garden, I will say that. But it's easy to pull out. Yeah, and these late bloomers are always welcome when most other things are getting shabby and going by. Uh, let's continue into the white garden. Sure. Or do you have <clears throat> anything to add on? Nope. Okay. We could one would talk about grass with the one is it's in flower. Yeah. I'm gonna come to this side just because the light's a little bit harsh. Um, there are grasses that bloom in the spring and the summer, but the majority of ornamental grasses bloom in the fall, and many of them continue to be showy um, through the winter months in their dried forms. This is a um, experimental selection of our native switchgrass, Panicum virgatum. Um, it's a large growing selection. There are selections of panicum that only get, you know, maybe about waist high or so. And this is just a, oh, I think they're about 18 months old. So yeah. they'll probably continue to get bigger. And it's in full bloom right now. And the weight of the developing seeds and stuff is causing it to bow over. But once the seed is mature and dries out, they tend to stand. Um, more upright, and the panicums just look glorious all winter long. In late winter, you might, if you're around them, you might hear this popping noise. The seeds are expelled explosively, um, and our native songbirds make use of the seed. The panicums are clump formers, so they don't run around like um, some other grass. About this piece. I, I can say a little bit. Doug asked me if I wanted to talk about this one. Uh, this is an Echinodorus. I can't remember the species, but it's uh, a Bracteatus. Okay. Um, Echinodorus Bracteatus, Lantu Beauty, I believe. Lantau Lady. Or Lantau Lady. Okay. Yeah. It's one uh, actually that um, our now past uh, friend um, Alan Galloway brought back from. Think Philippines. Philippines yeah. No, this is an American native. Um, and 
it's just been really cool. Uh, it flowers all summer for us. It, this is in the White Garden Water Garden, which you can no longer see. But the flower stalks, uh, they're, they're white three-petaled flowers. Um, once they get uh, are done flowering, they actually form plantlets all over the stems. The leaves are just so cool on this plant. Uh, you surely can see the texture on these things already. Can you hear them? And, yeah, exactly. Like Doug says, it's like plastic. Um, really cool plant for um, um, a moist part in your yard or a water, a small water garden. Uh, and then, like I said, the plantlets that form on this are really great. If you have an aquarium, um, this one might be a little bit big for it. But the thing that you might uh, know is if you had an Amazon sword. That's another Echinodorus um, species. And there's all kinds of Echinodorus that are used in the aquarium industry. But just for reference, that's what the same thing is. And it's perfectly hardy for us. Dies back through the winter. But then it comes back uh, with a vengeance through the summer. Just a cool plant. This is a former flower stalk. So every node on the flower stalk where there were flowers, they form this adventitious plantlet complete with roots and stuff. So imagine growing in a marshy area, these flower stalks just fall over and root in and eventually there's acres of it. But it, it is so cool for the texture in the garden. Um, now we're gonna go somewhere else in here. I think Doug had uh, something here. Um, some of the summer plants are still going strong. Um, and this is a little known ornamental grass. Uh, for the longest time, um, we didn't have a name on it, but a member um, uh, identified it for us. It's actually the same genus as corn, uh, mm -hmm. the plant that most of the world calls um, maize. Uh, the genus is Zia. Z-E-A, this is Zia perennis, referring to perennial. And though it is not winter hardy, it's a tender perennial, frost tender perennial, it is a, a perennial plant. And um, when it blooms, the inflorescence doesn't look at all like corn. It looks like a roadside grass that I've always known as shatter cane, but I seem to be the only one in the universe who knows that roadside grass is shatter cane. But um, it certainly looks like some of the variegated uh, seed strains of the true corn um, maize. But whereas they um, almost right away bloom and set seed, uh, this uh, just keeps on getting better all summer long. Oh, Tim found an inflorescence. Good for, I didn't even know it was still in bloom. Um, can I hold it and Sure, I'm not sure if I can get it to come into focus, but we can oh, see. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, um, this is a young inflorescence. It's sort of like the tassels of the corn up top. You have male flowers up top and um, female flowers down lower. You can see the stamens dangling out and the uh, stigma on the female flowers to capture the falling um, pollen. And then the, the fruit, the the uh, grains are, are cylindrical and stacked one on top of the other, like the roadside grass shatter cane. And then when they're ripe, they fall off. I don't know that um, we've seen um, ripe seeds on um, this um, corn, but a great um, summer foliage plant. Oh, did you want, are you still trying to focus on that? I'm sorry. No, it doesn't matter. No, no, not really at this point. Okay. And it might, that might've been better though. Yeah. We saw it really clear, Tim. That's good. And I always thought that plant looked a little bit like corn. Um, the uh, Japanese anemones, um, and then most of them are hybrids, so they're an enemy uh, hybrid. Um, this is one in the series, the Pretty Lady series, uh, Pretty La Lady Maria. It looks a lot like the old cultivar Honorine uh, Jobert, but Honorine Jobert is about five feet tall and usually doesn't manage to stand up. Um, this is a, has quite a full of flowers, Honorine Jobert, but it's nice to have these uh, three foot tall flower stalks um, that are standing upright. And there are um, 
a great perennial for the shade garden, for the lightly shaded garden. Um, they're not especially happy out in, in a location where they have full sun. Um, they also come in light and dark pinks. The foliage is handsome most of the warm growing season as well. Okay, um, let's, we, can, we can go either Ball Boulder first or Laugh House first. Wherever you want to go. Okay. Let's do the laugh. It has to be right in front of my face. <laughs> Actually, I can see. But. Oh, you know, I'll talk about the, And I, this plant right here, I found, I love that. Oh, I, meant, I saw that yesterday. Yeah, we'll talk about that. You'll have to remind me. Um, well, let's start with the non cyclamen and then jump back to the cyclamen. Okay. Um, so I'm going to undock here just a second. I found the last weed in the arboretum. <laughs> um, beautiful foliage. Of, you know, we all love flowers. Flowers come and go, but plants with beautiful foliage are, um, can be add a lot of beauty to the garden for months and months. Um, this is what we would generally call a geranium, but it's not a hardy geranium in the genus geranium, but it's in the genus um, pelargonium which is the same as the um, uh, zonal geraniums, those old-fashioned um, geraniums that everybody planted in big pots for Memorial Day and took out to the cemeteries. But this is an African species, um, Pelargonium um, transvalensis, and the um, cultivar is African princess. Um, you can see on this plant, it's starting to put up flower stalks and see the flower buds but um they're not yet blooming but you know i'd grow that plant certainly just for its foliage gorgeous foliage um and going from one house plant relative to another um, this is the the house plant known as spider plant is in the genus chlorophytum this is another species of chlorophytum. Is it capense? No, this I th is this um, thorn. Yeah. Oh, is, that, is it balcari? That sounds right. I think it's balcari. Yeah. Um, it's one that's been reliably winter hardy, just starting to bloom in uh, late September. It, it'll, it'll continue blooming up until a hard frost these big candles of white flowers. See, the foliage is much like a spider plant. It does not produce spiders, though. <laughs> no, it, no it, does, it doesn't make the little airplanes. No, it doesn't. But it, it makes a beautiful statement. I mean, if you want something upright for late in the season, the flowers open in the um, mid to late morning and they go into the evening. I wonder if any of the echiandians were working here. Uh, no. No. Okay. October is really when the various autumn flowering bulbs um, start to bloom. Um, certainly, uh, cyclamen are one of the highlights of the fall bulb display. This is cyclamen heterofolium. Heterofolium referring to um, leaves like ivy, hetera, and they will start blooming months earlier than this, but just as a smattering of flowers. But October is probably their peak month when you have just carpets of flowers. Um, yeah, they've been flowering, I think, since at least June. Yeah, that sounds right. And there might have been a couple to end of May this year. It's been a rather long season. This is the uh, typical color. This I, I guess mauvey pink is how it might be described. Pure white forms are readily available. There's some new color selections, a, a coral pink one and ones that are 
described as red that are not red, but they're really, really a deep sag saturated dark um, pink, almost red. The foliage on header foam is, uh, starts to come up late in its bloom period, and that's a really pretty one. Um, a solid green leaf is almost unknown in uh, cyclamen header folium. Uh, the leaves can vary in leaf shape and the degree of marking. There are selections for pure silver leaves. This is um, Cyclamen Graecum from Greece. Um, heterofolium is widespread all around the Mediterranean and probably further north into Europe. Um, the flowers are almost indistinguishable from heterofolium. The foliage is, uh, doesn't vary much in leaf shape, very strongly heart-shaped leaf with a satiny sheen to it. They can vary a lot in their markings. You know, that's a real lovely one. They're solid sort of silver pewter ones. Um, and cyclamen Graecum is different from all the other species of cyclamen in that the tuber has these tuberous roots that grow deep into the soil. It's very drought tolerant. The cyclamen are, are good for those um, shady spots that are dry in the summer when they're dormant. There's several other species that bloom this time of year. I don't think we'll see them today, Cyclamen mirabile and Cilicium. October is also when we start to see the, fall, the true fall blooming crocus, but I went looking yesterday and didn't find any. Um, we're entering the laugh house, so most of what uh, we're going to look at in here are, are really good plants for the shade garden. Um, the fuchsia, it's been blooming probably since May or so, maybe earlier. Um, and it's its not at its peak now, but it has been blooming its head off. This is... Um, Sandy Hoff. Yeah, it's one of those... Modern plants with a unfriendly cultivar name. And this one here, most fuchsias do not like us. They don't like temperatures above 90. This one has good breeding and it has good heat tolerance uh, to it. And it has done great for us. Like we kill almost every other fuchsia we plant. Um, and I'm seeing something in here. If, if you have these, we're getting a few fruit. Yeah, they're edible. And they are edible, yes, I've eaten them. Uh, I have a mask on right now, or I'd try one. <laughs> yeah, they're edible. They're not the, they're, they're okay. They're, yeah, they're passable. They're not yeah. strawberries by any means. No, but you know, maybe that's somebody's reading work to produce fuchsias with perfectly delicious fruit. But for us, this has been a really good um, hybrid. We have one other species that's been doing well for us here in the laugh house as well. Everything has stripes right now, so uh, in here. Where can you find that fuchsia? I've actually bought that fuchsia at Plant Delights, and I think I've seen it at Big Bloomers. Yeah. It's, that one's becoming much more readily available for us here. That one is readily available. Um, it, it, I'm always amazed at how new plants seem to come out of nowhere and more, there are more and more hardy uh, Gesneriids. Gesneria, the Gesneriaceae is the family of African violets and gloxinia and, and uh, you know, generally plants that we grow as house plants, but there um, are more and more that are proving to be winter hardy. And this one isn't one that is a new introduction, but it's really at its best this time of year. This is Titanotricon, old hamii. Um, 
I haven't looked up the meaning of titano tricon. Titan would refer to big, and um, tricons are hairs. So apparently, this has big hairs on some part of the plant. There's hairs all over the leaves and everything. Yeah, Just, I don't know that they're bigger than any other jessamine. Yeah, the leaves are sort of <laughs> rough with hairs, but it's definitely a shade plant. Um, it's been blooming blooms for an extended period of time. You can see this whole part of the inflorescence is already done blooming and now it's blooming on these side branches. It is a herbaceous perennial that disappears in the winter, but um, anything that blooms in the shade in the fall is really valuable. Tim and Doug? Yeah. Going back to the fuchsia, Paul was wondering how it would do in Brunswick County. I'd say it's worth a try. Um, they're even warmer than us at night in the summer. That's the key thing that can kill the fuchsias. But I mean, if there's one to try, try that one, that Sandy Hoff. Is, do you think this is blooming lighter than normal because it got pruned? No. Okay. Um, one of our favorite um, hydrangeas in the Laugh House is this one. It's um, Hydrangea in Volucreta. Um, Wim Rutten, R-U-T-E-N. It has the trademark name of Blue Bunny. Um, we enjoy it even out of bloom because the foliage is big and bald and clean. And then in bud, well, here, yeah, yeah Tim's going to... Actually, there's one back in here that's yeah. it's even tighter. The buds are fun, too. These very globular buds with very um, prominent... Uh, Brax. Brax. Yeah, they look and, like a peony bud to me. It, yeah, it's in, it's hydrangea in volucreta because an involucre is a whorl of Brax. And that's exactly what you're seeing when you look at the unopened bud. You see that it doesn't open all at one time. So it is, it's in bloom for a long period of time. And it does so much better for us than asparagus, which we can grow here, but they don't flower reliably. This flowers on new wood each year. Uh, so if we have a hard winter, the, or the asparagus don't flower, but the involucrata does. And it only gets uh, four to five feet tall, uh, while the, or the asparagus, they might get six or eight feet tall and you're not gonna flower on them. Yesterday, I went looking for uh, um, Camellia sasanquas in bloom and didn't find any. Found uh, many examples absolutely loaded with flower buds, but um, this is Camellia sinensis, uh, the source of tea, yes, in southern table wine. Um, it is a fall bloomer. Um, it gave, originally it was in the genus Tia, but then uh, taxonomists realized it needed to be lumped with all the rest of the camellias. So it's now Camellia sinensis, but the T name remains in the name of the family, the TACA. The first name genus gives its name to the family, uh, family name. And this is a large leafed T. Um, some of the cultivated forms have much smaller leaves. And it's Camellia sinensis is the source of green, black, and oolong tea. It just has to do with how the leaves are handled after they're harvested. The uh, toad lilies are shade garden plants, and most of them are late summer fall bloomers. Um, this is one with very beautifully variegated foliage. It's the cult of our name is um, Imperial Banner, um, but it also makes a very um, showy floral display. Yeah, you really don't need the flowers on this one uh, throughout the season. The foliage does start to look a little shabby at this time of year, but the flowers then distract you from that. So, uh, but up until that point, you have wonderful foliage.
And this is a, another Tricertus, a new introduction called Fluffy Orchid. Um, if you ever hear me call it Fuzzy Orchid, it's because that's what I thought its name was originally. Um, this has many stems because we took so many cuttings off of it earlier this year. But last year when it just had a few stem, stems, these clusters of flowers were about this uh, this wide and the plant was a bit taller. But is, it, is this one in the plant sale? This one is in yeah. the plant sale. I thought it was a good one to get to make available to our members. And I, I, what's it? This Mahonia. Oh, yeah. Um, I, I sometimes don't see things if I don't expect to see them. I know there must be the sign of uh, lunacy or something, but this, I don't think of Mahonias as blooming in the fall, but this one certainly is. And this is, is it Omiana? I forget if this one might have a name. No, this one does. Um, yeah. Well, it says eminences, eminences, but it has an X in there indicating yeah. that um, it's, it's a interspecific hybrid. It has gracilis or gracilipes is one of the parents, and I don't remember what the other one is mm. offhand. It has really handsome foliage. Um, I think that's the main reason to grow Mahonia. This floral display is really nice, and I think you're probably seeing in uh, Tim's filming that um, there are lots and lots of honeybees visiting the flowers. Trying, but it's not focusing the way I'd like. It has a light fragrance. It's not super fragrant like some of the winter blooming ones, but a nice sort of amber and and yellow flowers. The I'm guessing the um, the, bra the, oh, the sepals yeah. are kind of a copper color to them. And then the, the inner petals, I don't know if you can see it, they're actually pale yellow. So that's what gives it that color. Um, and it's, I don't know how old this plant is. Um, we've probably had it seven or eight years. It's accession, it was received in 2013. Okay, seven um, years. <laughs> so it's, it's about um, three foot tall, so not a, Overly large growing mahonia. There's a, an unnamed clone over here, okay. similar color, but it's a little bit more grand looking. Doug and Tim? It's the same species. Yes. That plant was received in 2013, yes. planted in 2015, yep. and it was received as a one quart container. Okay. Um, we're standing right here, so we might as well talk about. Um, hardy begonias. Um, this one that you see in the camera is, um, oh Lord, it, it has, it's the French cult of our name, yeah. Cote de Castille, Castillon. Something like Castellon. that. You're better um, than me. The top of the foliage is sort of a grayed burgundy, but look the way the sun shows off the underside of the leaf. Now, um, all of these got planted a year ago, so they've gone through one winter. Um, the Cote de Castillon um, is one that Plant Delights has found to be reliably winter hardy. This little beauty, um, little brother Montgomery, um, is supposed to be less hardy, but it, it did come through last winter, but um, might not a very cold winter. I was actually, you planted them relatively late last year, I think. And I thought, oh, those are not going to make it. Yeah. <laughs> and they made it. This uh, big robust one is pewterware. Nice sort of silvery leaf. with Fairly red underside. Mm, well, let's jump back to this in since we're on the subject of begonias. Of course, the most cold hardy of, of the begonias um, that I'm aware of is Begonia brandis. It's been in gardens for, for several lifetimes. Um, it's past its peak of bloom, but it blooms for a couple months, starting in late summer, continuing into about now. Um, we these, didn't, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. We didn't actually plant this one in here. It was a tag-along plant. 
<laughs> and I don't know if Doug was going to mention it, but they form tuberals. I don't know if I can focus on one, but there's a tuberal the tip of my finger here. Yeah, they're tiny little uh, bulblets essentially in the leaf axles, and they'll drop off and come up a lot like the bulbs on a tiger lily. I wanted to mention that these fruit will turn brown, but they'll stay shapely all winter yeah. long. So um, Actually, we have some. Don't, you don't need to, uh, don't cut it down right away. They're fairly attractive through the winter months. But we'll jump back to this fuchsia. This is the second one that has grown for us. Yeah, um, this is one Mark brought back from one of his travels, uh, fuchsia hatchibachii. Um, I think he brought it from England. Oh, here's its label. And I'm sure that's somebody's um, family name. You know, when people ask me how I pronounce my name, I, I tell them I don't know. But, you know, here's another name that I'm thankful I'm not burdened with. But um, so many plant names are just people's names. So maybe we don't need to be quite as scared about them. I should have grabbed flowers off the other, but you can see this is a much longer flower with very narrow, I guess those would be sepals, the yep. outer world, mm -hmm. with the purpley violet uh, petals in the center. But it has, again, this one hasn't been phased by the weather we had this summer that so often kills fuchsia. Yeah. Should I talk about the Bomeria? Sure. Bomeria, you probably recognize that it looks a lot like the florist Alstromeria. Uh, they are close relatives. Um, this is a large growing vine dying to the ground in the winter here, and they're not supposed to tolerate our growing conditions, but this one has been in the Arboretum for many years. I planted it in 2012. Yeah. Um, just has these terminal clusters of flowers. Simania. <laughs> yeah. Can you spell Bomeria for me? I'm just getting different uh, plants for some reason. B O M E R A, I think. B O M A R E A, I think. That might be it, yeah. yeah. See, there's oh, Bomeria and Bomeria and Bomeria. <laughs> they all sound the same, but they're three different spellings, and I think they're probably three different families' names. There's the little fern Bomeria. There's that Bomeria, and then there's the uh, nettle oh, yeah. relative Bomeria, oh, yeah. which is B-O-E-H-M-E-R-I-A. Yeah, I'm, I'm getting the nettle one. So how, how does that last one spelled again? D-O-M. Yeah? Um, E-R-E-A? Yeah. Okay. Mario. I think I got it. And Edelis is another species. That one we don't know the species on, but Edelis is a common species, which we have some in the nursery of. <laughs> we saw the um, Titanotrichum earlier, the African violet relative with the big yellow foxglove-like flowers. This is another member of the African violet family. This is Simania, little red. Um, you know, this bright, clear scarlet is, is just, um, I don't know, it makes me happy. And the foliage it has a bit of a sort of a coppery brown aspect to it, which sets off the scarlet even more. This one is a hybrid between um, when Tony collected uh, Simania or Gloxinia uh, nematethoides, I can't spit it all out, I probably missed a syllable, Evita, and then I believe crossed with Perennis, if I remember correctly, which gives it the darker foliage. It's taller than Evita, but smaller than Perennis. <laughs> this is um, reliably winter hardy. It disappears um, come winter and it's little bit late to come up in the spring, but uh, this is the kind of display it gives every year in, in uh, late summer and fall. Uh, 
<laughs> what is the little fern boom area? Uh, how's that one spelled? <laughs> I don't know. Why don't he just, is, is he in, fi he must be in FileMaker. There's one on the, uh, in R23. Yeah. Uh, well, I'll look it up. House, yeah. He could just put D O in, uh, what, what bed is that? L. -Y. Oh, he, he got the spelling for that. Okay. He was trying to find the fern name. Why? It's not as pretty, no. Am I making anybody sick yet? Just a little, Tim, but we're having a good tour. There you go, there's the fern. <laughs> that is, um, translates to Red Riding Hood. It's German. <laughs> I can't spit its name out. <laughs> Tell me when you're ready. Let's see here. I'll actually put this on the tripod so I have a little less motion sickness for you. Okay. Um, dahlias do grow in this climate. They will bloom fairly steadily all summer, but they are at their best in late summer, early fall. Uh, they just freshen up and uh, the flowers are bigger and more colorful. Um, Tim, I don't remember if these got cut back hard. I, uh, we did a little bit of a light cut yeah. back this year. I didn't get a real hard cut back. Yeah. But. If, if your dahlias have bloomed all summer and they look a little bit shabby come maybe about August or so, you can cut them back hard, even to the ground, and they'll put up new growth and be um, all that much more, all that much fresher. Um, most of these are volunteer seedlings. These singles are very fertile. Um, you might notice there's bumblebees and other pollinators visiting them. Yeah, the, uh, we started with um, several of the Bishop series. Like, I think this is actually Bishop of Canterbury, I think, still. And there's Bishop of Longeth over here. Uh, oh, and I'm in the light for it, but that one there um, and there's Bishop of York somewhere in here but uh, they've all crossed out and we've gotten some spectacular colors over the years that have naturalized in here. Almost all of them are single though there are a few semi doubles and no we do not dig these up. <laughs> yep. <laughs> no and um, in our climate um, we generally don't get the frost penetrating the soil to any great depth. Decades ago, when we had more typical winters, uh, the soil surface would freeze overnight and then thaw out each day. And so the frost never penetrated um, all that deep. Um, it's, uh, uh, this is not, I'm not the originator of this thought, but it is sort of like for plants that exist through the winter months above ground, we're probably zone seven, but when it comes to plants that die away in, in the winter and survive the winter underground, we, we're probably as a warmer zone because our cold spells typically are not um, of long duration. Frost doesn't penetrate the ground, so a lot of things survive underground that might not if we had long, cold zone seven winters. Are there any dahlias that do well on the coast? It seems like we're really kind of too hot to really get anything that's sizable. Um, I, I worked in Fort Valley, Georgia for three and a half years. 
And that's zone eight on uh, just below Macon, so just be, uh, below the fall line, but on the coastal plain. And there was somebody in town who grew dahlias for exhibition, so it's possible. Will they ever be the top quality of um, dahlias grown in Michigan? Probably not, but you know, you'll probably get enough pleasure out of them. Here in the border, I find the dark leafed ones do better for us through the summer months because um, uh, they'll start flowering in mid to late May uh, here typically and do a good flush in through June. Then they say it starts to get too hot and they, they take vacation. The green leafed ones will often go dormant totally for us and die to the ground. Well, most of the time, the dark leafed ones stay up. So they seem to be more heat tolerant to me. Um, that's just an observation, but they might, so you might try some of the dark leaf forms. Uh, the karmas are a, a, pardon? I said, will do. I know every time I go ahead and judge at the Dixie Classic, I'm just in awe at the size of the dahlias that I, I see there uh, to judge that, that I, are there at the show. I don't grow any of the dinner plates. I like the singles. Um and the uh, flowered ones. And so we don't have any of the, like the anemones or anything. We just have a handful of double, smaller double decorative type. Uh -huh. um, but the singles do best for us here, I think. Okay. Tim and Doug? Yes. I don't know if you saw that comment, but Steve just mentioned that the Joey and Karma series do well in warmer climates. I don't okay. know if you have any comments on that. Those are green leafed ones too. Uh, at least the Karma is, if I remember correctly, but you could try those. Did Chris say the karma and the Joey? Joey, I don't know Joey, Joey at all. Heard of Joey. Certainly know the maybe from Australia. Um, Steve spelled it J-O-W-E-Y, so maybe I'm pronouncing it a little bit off. No, okay. Still doesn't ring a bell. Yeah. Uh, Tim mentioned the dahlias with dark foliage. Um, Japanese bishop and bishop of Landaff are two old varieties, both of which had um, uh, dark foliage, bishop of Landaff had dark foliage that was dissected like that. The flowers were much that color, but you see the foliage itself is ornamental. And um, a really wonderful thing that dahlia breeders have done in recent years is to breed dahlias that stand up. If you've ever grown some of the older, larger flowered dahlias, they're really um, almost don't stand up at all. You have, you've seen the dinner plate ones grown on stakes like they were tomato plants or something. So the Karma series is one um, that um, stand up really good. And, um, you know, if you go into a mail order nurse, mail order catalog selling summer bulbs, you'll find a lot of really good values that were bred for sturdy stems. One, it's right in front of Doug, actually, is that it's a the bright yellow one right there. That, I think, is a remnant of one called Mystic Illusion is the trade name. It's Knockout is the, the cultivar. It's some, from breeding in um, New Zealand. And that one's been in here since 2007 or eight. So that one's been persistent. And I love the luminous yellow color against that dark foliage on that one. And I think Doug's going back in, he's going to one, it's a coccinium or coccinia. I can't remember which one or the other coccinius. Um, it's a species. Uh, it's a small flowered red one. It's kind of, it's much more open. It's really, it's more delicate. It's kind of cool looking. It's, it's one of the, I don't know how many parrots are in the background of the garden dahlias, but Dahlia coccinia, coccinia meaning scarlet, it's one of the parents. And, uh, the plant is usually five feet tall. Um, I think we might need to revitalize it this winter or next spring. That's a mighty fine, nice. This, right here. this is a seedling. Yeah. <laughs> one of my favorites is actually over here. Is this, oh, this one here. That one's been here for several years, probably oh, eight or 10 years. <laughs> and that one used to have white and red flowers. Yeah, Is it Tampico something? Yeah. Uh, 
Maxi Tampico. Maxi Tampico. I suspect Maxi might be the series yeah. of Tampico, the individual selection. And those um, were in the trials years ago. Yeah. It's been a really good doer. It's been in the border for a long time. Compact. Uh oh. What's that? Am I still there, Chris? You're good. Okay. I bumped something on my phone, and so the screen went dark. But I think it was the um, my helper on the phone. <laughs> and then we have a little dahlia that might, may or may not flower. Towering above this um, <laughs> now fairly tall dwarf crepe myrtle with this fine dark foliage is Dahlia imperialis, the tree Dahlia. It usually blooms late enough that the flower, flower display um, doesn't amount to a whole lot because usually we have a hard frost about the time it's starting to bloom. I think it would be a good one to plant under some very highland loblolly pines or something because that little bit of evergreen cover would protect them from the lighter frost. If we get if it doesn't get uh, terribly cold, it flowers in mid-November. One year we had it flower for two weeks, and that was about, that's the longest I've ever had it flower. Sometimes the flowers are just opening and they get frozen. But it is a cool statement of a plant for the back of a border. And you might think it has gigantic flowers, but it has these big sprays of flowers about the same size as a lot of these singles. Um, Talk about the ginger. Mm -hmm. You go ahead. We could talk about the soft salad. Oh, it, they look terrible. <laughs> oh my goodness. Smell? Yeah, I, I, I wish you could smell this. I don't know if you've all downloaded the fragrance app on your phone or your computer, but this, this one smells great. Um, this is a, a ginger lily. Same family as um, the culinary ginger. Culinary ginger makes a carpet of little flowers at the base of the stem, so they're not very showy. But the hedicheums um, have these terminal spikes of flowers, much like the cannon. And this is one, um, it's Dr. Moy. Uh, yeah. yeah, Dr. Moy, that has some striping in the foliage. Is a newer selection. Oh, it, that one's better. Quite nicely. Yeah. Yeah. But they grow from a rhizome that looks every bit just like the culinary ginger and spread fairly steadily. Um, so at some point, you end up with more than you need, but it's a great plant to share with other gardeners. And, um, you know, in my experience, deer don't eat ginger lilies no. or cannas. You want me to talk about that one then? You're welcome to. What else? Yeah, this is one. This is for this year. This has been a great plant, and I love oxalis. Um, this is, I think, a triangularis. This is Mike M I J K E. Um, there's several. Uh, I, there's probably three or four different um, triangularis here in the border, and uh, this is one. It's spectacular all, spectacular all summer. It's actually, it started flowering in February this year, uh, February and March. And then I think we had a freeze. It took it back for a couple of days and it's been flowering off and on the entire summer, but you have the purple foliage to go with it. And I think Doug wants me to go down here to another yeah. oxalis. Yeah, the, the oxalis triangularis is great for uh, summer color. Now this oxalis, oxalis bowii, named for someone named Bowie, um, is a true fall bloomer. It'll, it starts now and it will go up until a hard frost. Um, and it's dormant all summer long, but comes up in, uh, you know, mid fall or so. Um, I wonder if there's other color forms of it. And this isn't showing you um, at its best, it's just starting, but it really is very showy in bloom. You might as well mention the iron while we're frost. here, yep. This is another oxalis. It does have coral pink flowers, but it's grown more for its foliage. It's the iron, um, iron cross oxalis. I think it's oxalis 
Uh, oh. Is it Tetragona or? Yeah, that sounds right. The, they, has, it's gone through a couple different, or Tetraphila. There we go. Thanks, Chris. Four-leafed. Yeah, it's four-leafed like a four-leaf clover. And that one goes all summer long as well. Um, this is a spiral ginger. If you look at the stem, it grows in a spiral ha uh, growth habit. Um, it used to be in the ginger family, but um, has been separated out into its own family. Um, the genus is Costus, C-O-S-T-U-S, and the family is the Costaceae. Um, it uh, has these small tubular flowers. There's not one today that's in perfect shape, but I'll pick this one. It's just a small tubular flower. Um, the, the most astounding thing about this is if you ever touch the underside of the leaf, it is probably the softest thing you will ever touch. It's just dent covered very densely with a very short fine hair that is uh, softer than velvet. It doesn't look soft either at that. It looks like it should be smooth, but like you say, it's so, it's just, it, it, it boggles your mind whenever you touch it. <laughs> the, uh, Hardy citrus are loaded with fruit as they do pretty much every year. Um, they get their hardiness from the trifoliate orange, which is not a citrus, but in the genus Ponsiris, Ponsiris trifoliata. And, um, you know, these hybrids have the trifoliate leaf habit um, of the um, of the trifoliate orange. Uh, this is one leaf, and if you're familiar with the um, uh, lime leaves that are used in Thai cooking, this has very much the same fragrance. Um, I imagine it could be used as a substitute. This one right here is Dunstan, which is a grapefruit crossed with the trifoliate orange. It's one that's been around, I think, since the 20s or 30s when it was developed. Um, it's been in the garden for, oh, probably eight, 10 years at least, or actually 10, well, 10 or 11 years now. Um, it's quite large fruit, though the rind is about a quarter of an inch thick. Uh, and so there's not as much flesh in there. It can be eaten. It's a little bit bitter. And then next to it is one we received as a hearty orange times a sour orange. Um, but it looks a lot like a lemon. And I've used it like a lemon. We saw the um, ginger lily a few minutes ago. Look, um, yep. oh, this is the- uh, That's that little one. Conifer. Yeah. That died to the ground. Maybe it'll survive the winter. This is a uh, citrus japonica indicating it's from Japan, though the label says East Asia to China and Japan. It has tiny orange fruit. Um, I've seen the plant covered with fruit in, a, in warmer gardens. and. Worth, it's worth growing just as an ornamental. I can't remember what the fruit were like um, to eat. They, they were just citrusy. I guess you do it like a kumquat. You just eat the whole thing. Yeah. And there's like four little seeds in it, three or four seeds in it. Yeah. Um, we saw the ginger lily a few moments ago, uh, Dr. Moy. Uh, this is a wild parent of many of the garden hybrids. This is um, Hedicium coccinium. Uh, coccinium meaning scarlet. I wouldn't call it scarlet, but I'm not the one who named the plant. But it's been blooming for months. This is a clone uh, we got from um, Alan Galloway a couple years ago. That he collected yeah. uh, in Thailand, I think? Or Somewhere. Was he was often over there, so I'm not sure which country. 
we have another clone beside it and it doesn't flower half as long. So we're going through the jungle now. And very, very similar to uh, Hedicium coccinium and um, probably an offspring of Hedicium coccinium is this large late blooming ginger lily called um, Elizabeth. Um, it's a reliable winter hardy one for, you know, early fall floral display. It's very grand. Yeah. Um, Coccinium is not. The other day that this alpinia or ginger down here uh -huh. is blooming. Yeah. Yeah. And I, is this a ginger or is this a... This is gingerbura miyoga. Yeah. And I can't remember which cultivar. <laughs> um, this is a, in the genus Zingerbur with a Z, but that is the genus of the true gingers. And I told you that the uh, plants in this genus produce the flowers at ground level, and that's what Tim is showing you now. Now you can eat the flowers. Um, you know, I, I think I've eaten them in the past. Hmm. Oh, they're good. They have a nice spicy taste to them. Um, the new, the foliage when it's young and tender is also eaten. I have this one I like to it. There's a little bit of sugar in the or nectar in the base yeah. of it. Yeah, yeah, you get a. And then you get the sweet. ginger flavor uh, as well. Yeah, but um, you know, uh, other than the being able to eat them, I don't think you would grow this for its floral display. There's some forms of this that are really known for their foliage, um, and this I can't remember which one this is. I, but we have um, dancing crane is another one we have which has white bands on it. This one is variegation when it first comes up in the spring and then it fades out. Yeah. Uh, I don't think there's any flowers right now, no. but we do have baju. Yeah. Um, most of the bananas get gigantic, but this is the um, party of the Chinese yellow flowered hardy banana and you see i'm just shy of six foot and this is a, but a few inches taller than six foot so it's a smaller scale banana though given time the pump gets wider but it doesn't run around the garden the inflorescence on it is really cool it looks like a giant yellow artichoke bright bright yellow and often before it leaves out in the spring yeah Let's go look at some carrots. You say carrots? Yeah. <laughs> carrots. I always have to repeat myself when I say carrots. C A R E X. Everyone thinks I'm saying C A R R O T S. Okay, the uh, carrots family, the sedge family, is a large family, in a lot of ways similar to grasses. And in the genus carrots, plants tend to fit in two uh, disparate groups: one that love boggy sites, generally in full sun, and then woodland natives that often are very drought tolerant. But one thing that's typical of the genus carrots is that we don't usually think of them as being colorful or even showy in bloom, but this is an exception. This is um, Carex scaposa, which is a Chinese species. Um, just recently, you know, within the last 10 years or less, entered the uh, U.S. nursery trade. And um, rather handsome uh, foliage plant. It's largely evergreen and it'll have flowers periodically, but this fall display is the peak of its floral um, display. 
So a fun addition to the woodland garden. You see the plant is, oh, about a foot high, maybe a little bit more. It's, it's not a runner. Um, nice clumps. Many separate plants. See, this is one plant. And they're about two years old now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So oh, we, we might not be able to stay here long. Sorry, uh, I'm getting eaten alive as Doug's talking. So How are we doing to talk? it's a little after two. Oh, okay. Two ten. Yeah. Well, um, Chris, it's a little after two. We usually keep these to about an hour. About an hour and a half, but it's up to you. We did just have a question from Robin. She's wondering what KRX likes it wet and sunny. If you have a recommendation for her. There's an almost endless list of um, carrots that like wet, sunny locations. Um, pendula? Yeah, carrots pendula, carrots uh, lupulina, parrots, uh, carrots squarosa. Um, I know what, just um, go on to the Hoffman Nursery website. They sell a lot of grasses and carrots for any plant. There are a lot of nurseries selling native uh, wetland plants like mellow marsh. And, um, you know, I, I hate that I'm not remembering other names right now because I'm doing them a disservice. But um, there are quite a few nurseries specializing in wetland plants. That'd be a good place to start. Uh, we have a number of a few species in some of our new rain gardens. Um, this year we added expanded an older rain garden and added three more or just the two? Well, no, there's two, yeah. yeah two, um, expanded one and added two Actually, there's a third one, uh, which hasn't been planted yet. So the little well, one in the lawn. Near the new rain garden in the um, Asian Valley, why don't you walk near it and show everyone? There's not much to see. Well, we can still see it. I enjoyed seeing it. Kristen said that uh, Avarillo enjoys almost any condition. I kill that one. I love it, though. Wow. Everillo. And Jim, an inquiring mind wants to know what's eating you. Mosquitoes. That's what she was thinking. Yeah. Um, and someone has asked, what is a good time to divide hedicums? She has some outgrowing containers. Oh. <laughs> well, um, hedicums are reliably winter hardy in this area. or Well, uh, the ones that are winter hardy are reliably winter hardy in this area. Um, but I, I think if we had a cold winter, only the well-established ones would come through the winter. So if you, I would leave either leave them in place until the spring and then transplant them then, or you could certainly just dig them and store them like onions and potatoes over the winter and then replant them in the spring. And you also mentioned, she said pots. Is she growing them in containers? Yes. So if they were doing them in containers, you could probably do them almost any time. But you wouldn't want to leave that container outside. Um, most um, asters um, are sun plants, but there are a number of woodland asters, and this is an Asian woodland aster, um, Aster ageratoides. Varieties gabarulus, um, and it's a great big robust thing. This is a very shady and dry spot, and it looks just great in this location. There are other selections of Aster ageratoides um, that are more compact than this one. Um, and all, I think all of our native asters are no longer in the genus Aster. And taxonomists, I'm convinced, have a rule that if you change a plant's name, the new name has to be large and user unfriendly. Hmm, so hmm, hmm, hmm. Our, our native asters that used to be in the simple and descriptive genus aster are now in general like Symphio tricon and um, Arabia. Yeah. And what, what is the climbing aster? That's uh, ampel aster. Ampel aster, yeah. Yeah, um, there's lots of it. Uh, <laughs> oh. 
And let's see, this is Bodinarii? Yes. Yeah, this another fall blooming Mahonia, another Asian one, um, Bodinarii. Um, looks so much like the winter one. I don't get any fragrance from it. Oh no, I'm coming down with the sea thing. I'm going to have uh, um, West Nile virus pretty soon. <laughs> This is the one new rain garden, which it, doesn't look like much yet. Yeah, it was, this rain garden was created in July um, with the help of our summer intern. Um, most of the plantings are more recent than that. Some things haven't liked being transplanted, but I, I think they're still alive that we grow from the ground. Um, we also need to do some research as to what um, Asian plants are suitable to a rain garden. Thank you. Mm, can smell the citrus. Oh, we might have see. We saw the hardy citrus. We may have lost Tim temporarily. We'll see if he comes back. Sarah's trifoliata is fully deciduous, unlike the true citrus. Doug and Tim? Yeah. We lost you for just a little bit. At least I think we did. You showed us. Oh. Do you want to start over for the Ponceris? Okay. Sure. Um, we met the uh, hardy citrus of 10 minutes ago and mentioned that their cold hardiness comes from the trifoliate orange, which is a close relative, but in a different genus, the genus Ponsiris, Ponsiris trifoliata. And you can see the, um, the leaf is divided into three leaflets, just as in those two hybrid offspring. Um, and unlike the true citrus, this is fully deciduous. This is actually, um, a selection of the um, trifoliate orange called flying dragon that has contorted stems. You see the stems sort of wiggle this way and that. So it's a very striking plant um, in the winter months when it's leafless. It's also a great plant if your neighbor um, rhinoceros keeps on wandering into your yard. <laughs> the hedge of this would keep them from um, entering your yard. And you see the fruit is pretty much indistinguishable from a citrus fruit. Um, it's a type of berry called a Hesperidium, where it's divided into the typical segments of a orange or lemon or any of the other citrus. It's edible, <clears throat> it's loaded with seeds, it's extremely sour, um, but you know, can be a good um, uh, lemon substitute. It's um, much more cold hardy than the true citrus. I knew it growing up near New York City. It's certainly hardy um, in zone six, maybe colder. I've seen it in Pittsburgh. And that's probably- It's zone six. Five. Oh, it's zone six now. It, it's, it might be six B at this point. It used to be six A and where I was from was five A. Oh, <laughs> um, this is our most recently constructed um, rain garden. It's currently full sun. Uh, one of our goals in planting this rain garden was to screen the Hort Field Lab, which is what you see in the background. Um, and so in the background, we have uh, three young plants of Magnolia virginiana. Um, this is the southern form of virginiana, which is evergreen. The northern forms are deciduous. Um, and more shrub-like, very large shrubs, but the southern forms of Magnolia virginiana 
um, grow more like a, a magnolia grandiflora, more tree-like with a limited number of stems. Of course, their common name is sweet bay um, magnolia. It's also one of the plants that our state butterfly, the uh, tiger swallowtail, eats. Um, another, you know, there are a number of other native plants in here. Um, a selection of sweet pepper bush, clethra, um, viburnum obovatum. Um, not thinking of its common name right now. Is it Walter's viburnum or something? Maybe. And we do have a, um, a sedge planted. It's been doing really well since it got planted yesterday. Uh, you might have received this if you participated in our plant giveaway. Uh, Carex frankii. It's a native North American native sedge. Um, I don't remember what its inflorescences look like. Some of these wetland acarics have um, interesting seed heads. And it looks like um, <laughs> the garden director, Mark Weatherton, made a very apt comment one time that the rain garden uh, is a place that's very dry unless uh, for most of the time and then very wet during a wet spell. So the plants that go in this type of rain garden um, really have to be able to tolerate those wide uh, swings between drought and, and inundation. Um, but, you know, most of those plants are plants that occur in floodplains where there are those wide swings. This um, rain garden is to uh, meant to capture runoff coming down this uh, path here, bring it in here rather than continuing on beyond here and causing erosion. I think that's all I'm going to say about the screen, button. Any questions? Thank you for sharing those. I've kept up with the chat, I think, pretty well. But if anyone has any questions, go ahead and unmute yourself. You can ask it live. You can also ask it in the chat if you wish. This is a good time to ask Doug and Tim anything you want. Okay. We're going to walk over to one more plant here as you guys do that. So... Okay. Um, oh. I noticed this in bloom from a distance um, when we were standing by the rain garden. This is aloe um, maculata. The cultivar is Fort Worth. It came through its first winter last year just fine. There were additional plants up at, uh, of it up on the roof, but they died. I'm not sure it was entirely a matter of um, this site being more protected than up above. I, I think some plants don't like the super lean soil up on the roof. Um, these have looked great. Now, last winter wasn't that much of a test, but um, it went through last winter. Certainly showy this time of year. And um, this species, I think, used to be called aloe saponaria, yeah. the soap aloe. I guess the, I'm guessing that maybe the juice of the stems was used as, you know, like to create a lather. But the, the inflorescence certainly is showy. And it, did this one flower last summer or did it flower this spring? Um, it seems like it, it flowered one I other time. I think it flowered earlier this year. Yeah. So I think that's that's great. If we don't have any other questions. That was a great tour. Got a lot of compliments in the chat. So thank you very much for doing it. And sure. no one ended up in the emergency room with emotion sickness? Well, we, we don't know about you yet with all the mosquito bites. Mary that would be, yeah. took the mean earlier. In a few weeks, I'll find out if I have West Nile. Yes. We're keeping our fingers crossed for you, Tim. Okay. Oh, yeah. 
So, okay. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. <laughs> thank you very much for the tour, Doug and Tim. You guys did a great job. And thank you very much to everyone for joining us. We're so glad you took maybe your lunch break with us and uh, spent the uh, afternoon.